husband, Russell, is an artist. And I am May, and I have an interest in true crime. We decided to merge our two interests together. Enjoy this calming visual while listening to a tragic story. This is Stuart and Crime. After going out for some pizza, friends Matt Self, Austin York, and Mark Barbosa left to go home. Matt was driving, so they decided they would first drop off Mark at his aunt's house. Rosa Barbosa lived on Truett Street with two of her nephews, Mark and Robert. On March 12, 2004, she left work and went home to get ready to go on a walk with a friend at 8.30 p.m. Mark and his friends drove to the house sometime around 8.15. They all got out and went inside. At 9.30 p.m., Rosa's other nephew, Robert, came home to find the horrific scene of his brother and two friends shot. He then checked the back room where he found his Aunt Rosa dead. Running back to the front room, he then realized Matt was still alive and called 911. He told the dispatcher, My aunt, my brother is dead. I just got here. I've been here for 10 minutes. When police arrived, they found the three boys in the front bedroom. Mark and Austin were slumped over the bed, while Matt was lying on the floor near them. He was airlifted to Baylor University Medical Center in Dallas. Sadly, he passed away the next morning. As the police entered the back bedroom, the scene they found was brutal. Rosa Barbosa was lying face down on the floor, blindfolded, with duct tape around her mouth and a zip tie around her neck. She had a single gunshot wound to her head. While observing the scene, nothing seemed taken, and there was no forced entry, so the police developed a theory that it could have been a family dispute. They turned their attention to Robert, the one who called 911 after finding the bodies. Once in the interrogation room, Robert couldn't control his emotions. He told the story of what happened that night when he came home from work. He walked into the house where he saw his brother and his two friends shot. He then went to the back bedroom to check on his aunt and found her body, then realized Matt was still alive and called 911. But the investigators were confused with one little discrepancy in Robert's story. On his 911 call, he stated he had been home for 10 minutes, but the events he described should have only taken a few minutes. So they were curious as to what happened in those other six minutes. Robert seemed to be hiding something, so they asked him to take a lie detector test. He failed. They also tested him for gunshot residue, but he had none on his hands. So he didn't fire the gun, but what was he hiding? They would soon learn. The police at the scene found a marijuana plant in the garbage can of one of the neighbors, and this is when Robert confessed that the plant was his and after discovering the bodies, he knew he had to get the plant out of the house. This is what accounted for the missing time before making the 911 call. The reasons he gave for disposing of the plant was that he was on probation at the time and didn't want to get in trouble. But more importantly, he knew the murders had nothing to do with the drug and didn't want the police to come in and misinterpret the crime scene. With this new information, Robert was no longer a suspect in the murder of his brother, aunt, and two friends. The police now merged with a new theory. With everything the perpetrators did to Rosa, along with being bound and blindfolded, she was beaten and tortured, yet there was no sign of sexual assault. So they believe she was the intended target, since she worked at Cliff's Check Cashing Store. This connection became clear when on the same night of the murders, the check cashing store had their alarm go off, but when police showed up, 
they found the door unlocked, yet nothing was missing. Police released information on Matt Self's truck, which had been taken from the scene, and leads poured in about the car and everything else. The police pursued every last one of them, but only the leads on the truck were helpful. The investigators were able to locate the vehicle four days later at an apartment complex in Dallas. They set up surveillance on the vehicle and the apartment complex where it was found, hoping the shooter would return to the scene. Unfortunately, media reports revealed police were conducting a stakeout, so they pulled their surveillance and turned the vehicle over to the FBI. They found some good evidence that would be helpful in solving the case, which included fingertips of latex gloves and fibers stuck to the tape binding Miss Barbosa. Latex gloves found in the truck that police believe the suspects had access to and blood from the seat and floorboard of the vehicle. A month passed before the police caught a break in the case. On April 15th, police arrested a man by the name of James Jones. He was being arrested for aggravated kidnapping. In worrying about serving a lengthy sentence for this crime, he decided he wanted to cut a deal. So on the way to the county jail, he started talking to the arresting officer, saying he had information about the quadruple murder. James Jones was a confidential informant for the narcotics department. He would provide information on drug dealers, and if the tips resulted in an arrest and conviction, he would get money in exchange for the successful information. So they were inclined to believe his statements about the murders on Truett Street. In the interview, I can clear this case. Right now, you know what I'm saying? I ain't bluffing. You, or whatever, you know, I ain't trying to waste your time. But I can clear this case. Jones said he had been at Rosa's house on the night of the murder. He said the murder was about drug money. He was sitting in the living room drinking a beer while Rosa, Mark, Matt, and Austin were all in the kitchen. Two men he was acquainted with walked into the house, walked past him to the kitchen, and an argument ensued. He then heard gunshots, and he and the two perpetrators ran from the house. The names he gave police were Jacory May, 22, and Calvin Walker, 28. They were arrested the next day, Friday, April 16, 2004, and all three men were charged with four counts of capital murder, with bail set at $4 million. Walker said in an interview from jail that he wasn't involved in the shootings and wanted to take a polygraph test, stating he barely knew May and had never met Jones. I don't know how my name came up, he told the newspaper. I didn't shoot anybody, no ifs, ands, or buts. May also denied any involvement in the slayings, saying he knew Jones, but that they weren't close and did not hang out. They also all gave DNA samples, but they didn't match any taken from the crime scene. Jones also kept changing his story through subsequent interviews, where he admitted he actually shot Rosa after Walker and May killed Mark, Austin, and Matt in the front bedroom. He seemed to implicate himself more and more with each interview. He also knew details of the murders that were not known to the public, like where the bodies were in the house. But when asked questions on such things as what color duct tape was around Rosa's face, he could not give an answer. Eventually, they gave Jones a lie detector test, which came back deceptive, and they believed he was no longer a viable suspect. On July 15th, police dropped the capital murder charges against the three men, and this was on the eve of a state deadline requiring that the cases be presented to a grand jury within 90 days of a felony arrest. The police still believed they had the right suspects, so they set out to find any evidence linking them to the crime scene. Captain Randy Rowland, head of the McKinney Police Criminal Investigation Division, enlisted the help of the FBI, stating, we're just looking for a fresh set of eyes and more experience to look at the case, but we're continuing our own investigation. 
And if we get a break in the case, we'll go ahead with the rest. The police felt they would soon have help with their case when they broke up a drug ring of eight people. One of them, the leader, was Ja'Cory May. May and seven others accepted a plea agreement in January of 2005, pleading guilty to federal conspiracy charges and got the minimum of 15 years without the possibility of parole. Police were hoping that this lengthy sentence might make it easier for people that were once afraid to talk about the quadruple murder investigation in the past might come forward now and talk to the police. Or they were hoping someone involved in the drug ring may know something about May or the others that will lead them to the killers. A $50,000 reward remained in place for information leading to arrests and convictions in the quadruple murder. The rest of 2005 passed. 2006 passed. At the beginning of 2007, the department hired four new investigators with pretty diverse backgrounds in different fields of police work to review the clues and evidence collected in the case. They were also hoping to find things that might have been overlooked or unexamined, re-interviewing people connected to the case and search out new leads. But 2007 seemed like it was going to pass with no conclusion to this case. Then, in June of 2007, the police got a call from a woman named Talisha Haithcox. She was dating a guy by the name of Eddie Williams. On the call, she told the police her boyfriend was involved in the Truett Street shooting. The couple went to the police station together on June 14th, cooperating fully with the police. They had Williams take a lie detector test right away to know if he was being truthful with his statements. And it turns out he was telling the truth about being in the house on the night of the murders. He also implicated two others in the murders, brothers Raul and Javier Cortez. Williams detailed how he went over to Raul's house to discuss their plans to rob Cliff's check cashing business and how they planned to get into the business by going after the manager, Rosa Barbosa. The brothers then pulled out a bag filled with guns, duct tape, ski masks, and a plastic zip tie. Williams originally told the police he was forced at gunpoint to participate in the crime, stating that he was only the lookout and stayed outside during the shootings. But then the police, again, got a call from Talisha, who said Williams was more involved than he had admitted. So he changed his story, stating that the brothers wanted him to be a distraction. He was to go knock on Rosa's door and ask if she had seen a puppy. When he did this, the brothers pushed past him and knocked Rosa down to the ground, bound her hands behind her back, and took her to the back bedroom while he stayed in the living room. Rosa's nephew, Mark, and friends, Austin and Matt, were pulling into the driveway at this time, which surprised Williams and the Cortez brothers. They waited for the boys to come in and ambush them. Raul and Javier shot one or more of them, but forced Williams at gunpoint to shoot Austin. They then fled the scene, and with the business keys in hand, they headed straight to Cliff's check cashing store. William said he stayed in the car while the brothers went inside, but as soon as they unlocked the door, the alarm went off, and they were only in the store for a few minutes. The brothers came out empty-handed, and they drove away. The investigators were curious as to why, after three years, Williams decided now was the time to come forward. He said that his father had just died, and now his spirit knows what he did, and he couldn't handle the fact, and needed to come clean. But the police only had Eddie Williams' word. They needed some sort of physical evidence to tie the Cortez brothers to the murders. That is when Williams remembered that while planning out the robbery, Raul shot the same gun used in the murders into the ceiling 
while Javier ran outside to see if the shot could be heard. It turned out the house was now owned by a McKinney police officer. He allowed them to search his residence. They found the bullet fragment, and it matched the bullets found at the crime scene. They now needed DNA evidence to link the brothers to the crime. The police watched Raul and Javier and waited for them to dispose of something they could discreetly take. Luckily, both brothers smoked, and on their work breaks, the police were able to pick up the discarded cigarette butts. And Raul's DNA matched the DNA taken off of the duct tape at the scene. Unfortunately, nothing matched to Javier, but they were able to get a warrant to search his house. There they found three guns, none that matched the ones used in the murder. But they were able to use this to hold him on a federal gun charge and a charge of providing false information on a firearms application. An arrest is a milestone. It's not the end of the investigation. It's a milestone in the investigative process. We'll continue our investigation. Captain Owen said we'll find evidence that links these suspects in. And it solidifies the case even more, although we have a very solid case against them. We're also going to say and continue, you know, we have three suspects in custody. There's absolutely nothing right now that says there wasn't a fit. And we're going to see if we can continue our investigation and see if there's others involved. We're, we are not finished by a long shot. This is a milestone in the investigation. It is not the end of the investigation. Raul Cortez was charged with five counts of murder, and his trial started in January of 2009. The jury found him guilty and sentenced him to death. No execution date has been set. Eddie Ray Williams took a plea deal and was sentenced to three concurrent 20-year sentences. He would first be eligible for parole after 10 years. Javier Cortez was not charged in the deaths, but served a four-year federal sentence on a firearms charge. The three original suspects that were charged with the murders and then let go all went on to go to jail. Calvin Walker was accused of kidnapping and raping a 19-year-old woman on December 5, 1999 in Dallas and trying to kill her by burning down one of the buildings where he raped her. He received a guilty conviction and life sentence for a first-degree felony charge of aggravated sexual assault. Walker didn't become a suspect in the case until November 2006, when his DNA matched the victim. DNA that was obtained when charged in the Truett Street murders. James Jones stabbed his wife to death in 2015. She was found in her car in the parking lot of a Dollar General. He pled guilty and was sentenced to life in prison. And, as mentioned before, Ja'Cory May was sentenced to 15 years for the drug ring the police broke up back in 2005. Matt Self was 17 when he was killed. He was a junior at McKinney North High School where he was a linebacker for the Bulldog football team. He was also in the National Honor Society and a member of the Fellowship of Christian Athletes. I'd laid in his bed one night, we just were talking about things. And, and he actually told me, he said, you know, Mom, I don't think I'm gonna live to be 18. And I said, why would you say that? And he said, I just have a feeling I'm not. And I said, Matt, you have a lot ahead of you. You have college, you have a family to raise, you're gonna have my grandkids, you know, you're gonna be fun, don't feel like that. After Matt passed away, we received so many letters about how Matt and how he lived and what happened made him a better person because of him knowing him and what he believed in. Austin York was 18 when he was killed. He was a junior at McKinney North High School, where he played for the Bulldog football team and competed in track. He also served as the junior class secretary in the student council and was part of the Fellowship of Christian Athletes. He was employed by Market Street Grocery and was a junior deacon at the First Christian Church in McKinney. 
the media kept labeling him as McKinney North football player. And of course to us, he was just so much more, so much more. Um, just such an integral part of our family because family was so important to him. He absolutely adored his sisters and um, loved them in a way that I think is uncommon. Very genuine, and he loved to spend time with his family. He was a person that was filled with a lot of love. He loved his family, he loved his home, he loved his community, he loved his school community, he loved his teammates. And when he loved, he loved genuinely. If nothing he did was half-hearted. If he did it, he did it because he meant it. And um, he was one of those people who was very true to himself. And I think that's very rare and very special. Mark Barbosa was 25 when he was killed. He operated a shutter business with his brother, Robert Barbosa. Mark was described as McKinney North High School's biggest Bulldog fan. He'd paint his face and cheer on his younger brothers, Alex and Leonard, who played for McKinney North. So definitely, Mark was a role model. Somebody that, that I looked up to, and we both did. Uh, somebody that, at the time, when I was younger, I thought I was an old man. You know, he was 24. When I hit 24, I was like, ah, you know, like, I'm still, I still feel like a kid. I don't know anything. Like, I don't, you know, I, I mean, maybe he was, you know, ahead of his time. I don't know. He just, he felt, he just felt like he just knew everything. He felt like he had the answer to something. Or at least, or at least point you in the right direction. I know for sure I look at my kids and I, I even, even my wife, man, if you could have just met him, you know, if you could have just met him, you know, he would have loved you, you know, he would have loved you and you would have loved him. You know, and I, I think about, you know, my baby, and I'm just like, dang. I have qualities that I know that I got from my dad, and I know I have qualities that I got from my older brother, you know, and it's something that I wish, that I hope that my son can say that, you know, he got from me, or if he points at a picture and says, Dad, who's that? And that was your uncle, you know, that was, you got your other uncle, but, you know, that was your uncle that, that's where I get a lot of my characteristics from, so. Rosa Barbosa was 46 when she was killed. She is remembered as a very down-to-earth lady, independent, and having a giving spirit. If you enjoyed this video, please hit the like and subscribe button below. If you want to inquire about a commission, you can email Russell at russellstuart.art at gmail.com. You can watch Russell live stream his art on Twitch. And if you want to hear more true crime stories, you can subscribe to my podcast, Crimes of a Decade, a Texas true crime podcast. Now that we are done, make sure to wash the brush. Just beat the devil out of it.